Well, welcome back to our series on Walk Through the Old Testament. And today we start tackling what is often seen as the most difficult book in the Old Testament to understand, the book of Leviticus. Now, Walk Through the Bible has a simple way to remember the content of Leviticus. And you can see it behind me in the picture. You notice the man is wearing a pair of jeans, which gives you two clues. We ask the question, which company is known for making jeans? And of course, it's Levi's. And Leviticus is named after the tribe of Levi, for you could not be a priest unless you came from that family. And there's the second link. (laughs) It's in the genes. Now, you will notice that Levi is holding up two plates. On one side, there is money, and on the other, food. And from that, we see that Leviticus teaches us about offerings, symbolized with the money, and feasts, symbolized by the food. Now, there are five offerings, and we will look at each of them, and there are seven feasts, which are the festivals where the people celebrate God and the events of God in their lives. So that is the simple way to remember the outline of Leviticus, offerings and feasts. But there is much, much more within this book, and sadly it's probably the most unread book in the Bible. Now keep in mind that there are two threads running through Leviticus, which is true of all of the Old Testament. The first is this book is a manual for the Jewish Levites, who are the priests. And many of the directions have little to do with our world because remember when Jesus died and he said it is finished and the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And that was God's way of saying there are now no barriers separating us from him. And we know the cross has opened the door and all we need to do now is come in. Well, the second thread is what I call the Jesus story. We can learn so much about the ministry of Jesus as we study this book, but you will not learn by listening alone. You need to take notes. You need to read the scriptures. You need to make your own summaries. And when it comes to studying the Bible, always remember 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Now, thinking over what you read is the first part. And when you do that, God will enable you to understand what the passages mean. To start with, you might only see the basic facts. But as you keep looking and thinking about what you are reading, the deeper understanding grows. You see, that was God's promise. He'll give you understanding. Well, this book was written to teach the people of God how to live a holy life and a life that would please God. And remember the Apostle Peter quotes Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44 and 45, when he said, and I quote, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he, that is God, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. And the word conduct just means the way you live life. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Those are the words of 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 14 and 15. Now we need to see that the teaching model that God is using here, for remember the whole of the first part of the Bible, what we call the Old Testament, is recorded to model out for Christians how their salvation was procured and how they are to live once they've embraced that salvation. And the nation of Israel becomes the model to illustrate these truths to us. And Leviticus is filled with them. When you follow the steps of the nation of Israel coming out of Egypt, you see that they had been saved from slavery and they'd left the world of slavery behind them. Now we know that slavery is a picture of sin. And all mankind is subject to its tyrannical demands. As Jesus said, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Those are the words of John chapter 8, verse 34. Well, Israel experienced 
their salvation from judgment because of the Passover lamb. That's the story of Exodus 12. And as 1 Corinthians 5 and verse 7 teaches us, Jesus is our Passover lamb. So if the Son, as Jesus said, sets you free, you'll be free indeed. Leviticus teaches us how to maintain our fellowship with God in this new freedom that he has purchased for us. And while Leviticus is a book that is seldom read, we should be aware that it is quoted over 40 times in the New Testament. And many other passages in the New Testament are influenced by the words and the teachings of Leviticus. Therefore, we need to know Leviticus to understand much of the New Testament. You know, it's helpful to get the big picture of any book before you dig down into it. And with Leviticus, we need to remember that God has made a promise to Abraham way back there in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. For he said, In you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now, while this blessing came through our Lord Jesus Christ, there is also great blessing to live according to the directions that God gives us. And we will find many of these in the book of Leviticus, set out in principles and illustrations and metaphors. So what are these big picture lessons that we should learn from Leviticus? Well, first, we learn that without the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness. The book opens with sacrificial offerings. This highlights for us the importance of the cross, because the cross is the basis of our relationship with God, both in starting that relationship and maintaining it. And secondly, Leviticus teaches us the importance of embracing the laws of God, the teachings of God. You will find in the second part of the book, that is chapters 18 through to 27, a whole set of standards that Israel was to live by and thereby illustrating to us the importance of our living by God's standards and directions. And thirdly, the holiness of God is everywhere in Leviticus. And when his holiness confronts man's rebellious disobedience, we find there are always consequences. Fourthly, we find that God called Israel to separate themselves from the surrounding nations. It becomes obvious that these nations live life in rebellion against the God who created them. You know, Isaiah the prophet years later would highlight the importance of this separation where he asked the people to come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and don't touch the unclean things. That's Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 11. So the lessons we are to learn while we live in this world is we march by the beat of a different drum. We can liken ourselves to being in a boat on the ocean. And as long as the water is outside the boat, we're safe. But should that water get into the boat and enough off it, it'll sink. So if we let the world's values govern our lives, that will end up destroying us. The God of Leviticus has not changed and his standards for Israel are the same standards for us in our world. We find the way God deals with people in Leviticus and it models for us in symbolic and pictorial ways a life that God desires us to live, holy and separated and set apart for him. The Apostle John said, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him that is God, and yet walk in darkness or live in darkness, we lie, and we do not put the truth into practice. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son purifies us from all sin. I love those words in 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 to 7. Well, Leviticus also provides a law of civil law that contained the principles that I believe should even guide our legislation today. It speaks about religion and government. It talks about capital and labor. 
It talks about land ownerships and property rights. It talks about marriage and divorce. And God's guidelines for each area is laid out within the book of Leviticus. And Leviticus is also a treasure house for the symbolic introduction to Jesus. While we are people of the new covenant, within the old covenant, we see the meanings underpinning the reasons and the processes of the new covenant. We see in model form how our salvation is created and maintained by the offerings and the priesthood. And we are also given the calendar that reveals God's divine timetable. There may be few dates given, but we get the great insight into what is coming and what has already been fulfilled. For example, the feast of the Passover and Pentecost has already been fulfilled, but we are all waiting for the feast of the trumpets. Well, we'll get to that when we come to our next lecture. In studying Leviticus, we need to remember that the book is not speaking about how sinners come to saving faith. For that has already taken place through the Passover lamb in Egypt. For us, it occurs when Jesus was crucified as our Passover lamb, as we read in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. We have been justified by faith in Christ, our Passover lamb. And Leviticus, therefore, is all about maintaining the fellowship we have received. You know, in Genesis, it gives us the remedy for man's sin. It was through the seed of a woman. You've got that in chapter 3, verse 15. In Exodus, we see the salvation through the shed blood of the Lamb. That's in chapter 12 and verse 13. But in Leviticus, we see the fellowship that is sustained by a priest, a sacrifice, and an altar. The priest mediates. The sacrifice provides forgiveness. And at the altar, we find reconciliation. You see, this is the gospel in the Old Testament. The mediator. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2.5. The priest. Jesus is our high priest, interceding for us in Hebrews chapter 7. And our sacrifice is Christ Jesus, the Lamb of God, that takes away the sin of the world in John chapter 1, verse 29. And when it comes to the altar... Our altar is the cross, for through it we have found reconciliation with God. In 2 Corinthians 5 and 18, this reconciliation can be seen in the opening verses of Leviticus chapter 1, where the Lord is speaking to Moses from the tent of meeting. Now remember this, God is coming down to the people here and fellowshipping with them. But remember back in Exodus, you have Moses speaking to God in the mountain, totally separated from everyone else. Now we see God coming to the tent of meeting to speak with his people. And this is the beautiful picture of fellowship that God desires with the saved souls of his community. So let's look at how the book is presented and then we will dig down into its teaching. As I've already said, the book is divided into two sections. The first, chapters 1 through 17, where it deals with maintaining a right relationship with God. And the second half, chapters 18 through 27, deal with how to live out our relationship with God within our communities. Now we start with the five offerings. And the first is in chapter 1 and it is called the burnt offering. And the second is called the grain offering or the meal offering. And that's in chapter 2. The third is known as the peace offering in chapter 3. And then we have the sin offering in chapter 4 verse 1 through to chapter 5 and verse 13. And finally, the fifth offering is known as the guilt or the trespass offering. And that's in chapter 5 verse 14 through chapter 6 verse 7. Well, the rest of the first section, that's chapter 6, verse 8 through to 7, verse 38, deals with the regulations that govern these offerings. Now, the first thing you notice is that the offerings are in two groups. The first three carry the, this conclusion, 
that they are a pleasing aroma to God. You read that in chapter 1, verse 9, 1, verse 13, uh, chapter 1, verse 17, chapter 2, verse 2, chapter 2, verse 9, chapter 3, verse 5, chapter 3, verse 16. And these offerings were known as voluntary offerings. But the last two are not referred to as pleasing aromas to God. They were compulsory offerings. And you will notice, however, that each of these two offerings carried the phrase, and they shall be forgiven, and they shall be forgiven, they shall be forgiven. So these offerings are full of spiritual significance, and they point to the sacrifice of the cross. It can be helpful to look at these offerings with the first three through God's eyes, where they are classified as that pleasing aroma. You find those words in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 2 also. But the last two offerings are being viewed through man's eyes. So they teach us what Christ's sacrifice means to us. So this is why we read nine times, as we've already noted, and they shall be forgiven and they shall be forgiven. Well, let's look at the offerings. The first is the burnt offering. It's in chapter 1. It calls for a bull or a sheep or a goat. And if there were insufficient funds for these, because of the person's social standing, a turtle dove or two pigeons could be killed. Now you will notice that the animals that are offered were males without blemish. That's in verse 3. Which is significant because it points to Jesus. You see, Jesus is the sinless Son of God. He is without blemish. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So you see the link there. And then also in 1 Peter chapter 1, we read in verse 18 and 19, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood, there it is, the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. So we are dealing with a person that commits known sins and is seeking God's forgiveness. And in verse 4 we read, and he shall lay his hands on the head of the burnt offering, which means that he was passing on to the animal to be offered the consequence for the sins that he has committed. Now we know from Romans chapter 6 verse 23 that the wages of sin is death. Don't overlook verse 5, for it says he, that is the offerer, shall kill the animal. In other words, he is confessing that what is happening to this animal should have happened to him. And we know that the New Testament teaches that no animal sacrifice could ever pay the debt of a person's sin, which means that this is one of the many times where God looks through the tunnel of time and he sees Jesus dying for the sins of this offerer. Remember what it says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23 through to 26, which affirms that the statement that I've just made. Yes, all have sinned, all fall short of God's glorious ideal. Yet now God declares us not guilty of offending him if we trust in Jesus Christ, who in his kindness freely takes away our sins. For God sent Christ Jesus to take the punishment of our sins and to end all God's anger against us. He used Christ's blood and our faith as the means of saving us from his wrath. In this way, he is being entirely fair, even though he did not punish those who sinned in former times. And here it is, what I was referring to. For he was looking forward to the time when Christ would come and take away those sins. And now in these days also, he can receive sinners in the same way because Jesus took away their sins. That's the way the Living Bible Paraphrase translation puts it, and I like it. You see, that statement, for he was looking forward to the time when Christ, 
would come and take away those sins applies to all of the offerings in the Old Testament. Now you can liken the burnt offering sacrifice to 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 and 9. We've already read those words, but let me read it again. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from every sin. And if we confess our sins, just like the offerer in the Old Testament, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. So the burnt offering in the Old Testament was the way that God dealt with the sins of his people through a sacrifice. And in the New Testament, it's the same. We confess our sins and we are forgiven because of the cross. Well, the second offering is found in chapter 2 and it's called the grain offering. Now, there's no blood mentioned here, so we're talking about the life lived by Jesus Christ. Do you remember at the crucifixion, Pilate said, I find no fault in this man? And notice Leviticus chapter 2, verse 4. There was to be no leaven or yeast in this offering. Now, in the Old Testament, yeast or leaven is the picture of sin in the Bible. It, it, it's used to illustrate sin because once you introduce yeast into flour, it spreads everywhere. It can totally contaminate it. Well, note it was fine flour also that was to be mixed with oil. And oil is the symbol of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. And we know that Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. There are many ways that you could bring the grain offering to God, but all of them had the same composition, fine flour mixed with oil. And this is the symbol of our Lord's life. He was the grain of wheat, as he said, that would fall into the ground and die, and through that bring forth much fruit in John chapter 12, verse 24. He lived his life in total obedience to the Father, and at all times he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was a fine, fine flower. He was an offering to God by the life that he lived. Well, the third offering is called the peace offering. It's in chapter 3. Now remember, Jesus is known as the Prince of Peace. And within the New Testament, we see peace referred to in different ways. Firstly, as peace with God. You have that in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is speaking of how the death of Christ has paid the debt of our sin. And now we are at peace with God. You know, we started life at war and hating God. And we never wanted to obey God, as Romans chapter 8, verse 7 indicated, where we read, the sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's laws. And notice this, nor can it do so. Nor can it do so. And he says that those that are controlled by their sinful nature cannot please God. Well, now through faith in Christ, we are adopted into the family of God and we are at peace with God. The second description of peace is the peace of God. It's in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. It applies to the sacrifice of our Passover lamb, which is Jesus Christ, and the believer already having peace with God. Now we've got the peace of God. And notice what it says. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding. And this is what it will do. It will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So I take this offering to be referring to the peace of God. That is keeping our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus or through Christ Jesus. You see, the offerer wants to express their gratitude to God for this life sustaining joy. It's a bit like the words of 2 Corinthians 9 and 15. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gifts. So the focus of the peace offering 
is expressing gratitude for fellowship and communion with God. Now we have the fourth offering, and it's called the sin offering, and it's in chapters 4 and 5. And this offering is portraying Christ as our sin bearer. In the New Testament we read, He, Jesus, was made sin for us. For our sakes, He, that is God, made Him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin. Why? So that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. That's 2 Corinthians 5.21. So Christ became the sin offering for our redemption. You know, God made him sin. That is to say, God the Father made his innocent incarnate son the object of his wrath. So Christ on the cross, the sin of all who believe in him, are judged and taken away. And this is why this offering, like the following, focuses on and he shall be forgiven, and he shall be forgiven, and he shall be forgiven. It is called the atoning sacrifice. Atone means that through this offering, God and man can now be at one. There's where the word comes from. Atonement at one meant. And the required offering varies with the situation of the worshipper. If they can't afford a lamb, then they can bring a turtle dove or two pigeons as it says in verse 7 of chapter 5. And it was an offering to make an atonement for unintentional sins or ritual impurity or neglect or thoughtlessness. Again, it teaches us that God never trivializes with sin and neither should we. You know, God noticed sins of omission, the things that we fail to do, as well as the sins of commission, the things that we do that we shouldn't do. And now we come to the final offering. It's known as the guilt or the trespass offering. And you read it in chapter 5, verse 14, through to chapter 6 and verse 7. When you see a sign, trespasses prosecuted, it means that there are lines drawn that you can't cross. And if you do, you've trespassed. Well, this offering deals with people that have crossed the lines that God has drawn. And it appears that the acts were sometimes unintentional. However, when the person becomes conscious of them, they recognize their guilt. So an offering was required to restore the right relationship with God. And then notice this. And if another person was impacted by the actions, restitution had to be made to that person. You know, an illustration is given us in chapter 6, verse 5, of someone who'd borrowed something and didn't return it. <laughs> you know, that's classified as theft. And it says, And he shall restore it in full and shall add one-fifth, that's 20% of the value, and give it to him to whom it belongs on the day that he realizes his guilt. An illustration is given in chapter 6, verse 5, of someone who borrowed something and didn't return it. <laughs> now, that's classified as theft where we read, and he shall restore it in full and shall add one-fifth of it, that's 20% the value, and give it to him to whom it belongs on the day that he realizes his guilt. And he shall bring to the priest as his compensation to the Lord a ram without blemish out of the flock or its equivalent for a guilt offering. You know, these offerings illustrate the statement that ignorance is no excuse. You know, I remember being fined for parking my car in an area where there were other cars parked and there were no signs prohibiting parking as far as I could see. But the local council's bylaws, which I'd never read, clearly stated that I wasn't allowed to park in places like this. My ignorance was no excuse and I had to pay the fine. Well, the writer goes on and gives us four illustrations of unintended sin. The first is failing to appear at court as a witness when you were called. The second is a person touching a dead animal's body. Now, obviously, this could be the means of bringing disease back to the community, so was therefore forbidden. And the third one is a person touching human uncleanness. An example might be, 
be that of leprosy. And again, you would bring that back into your community. The fourth one was, when you make a rash oath, and yet you fail to fulfill it. You see, God says your word is your bond in his eyes. Well, again, this gives us an insight into the holiness of God. When we are told not to do something, we are accountable even if we are not aware of the rules. And God never turns a blind eye to our negligence. We might look at these things as insignificant, but the character and the holiness of God obviously has his reasons for stipulating prohibitions to certain actions. So the Hebrew people had to seek his forgiveness through a guilt offering. This was an atoning sacrifice of a ram or a lamb, again with no physical defects, modeling the sacrifice of Christ. And it was to pay for the sins against God and against people in the community if their actions impacted them. And if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of a defiled person could cleanse them, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Well, there we have it. We've come to the end of our first lecture in Leviticus. And I'm sure it raises many issues in your mind that you need to go back and contemplate and work your way through. In our next lecture, we will start looking at God's calendar in Leviticus chapter 23. And I would encourage you to read that before you start the next lecture. Well, until then, may your studies create in you a passion in your heart for God through his word. Until then, God bless. Mm -hmm.